Hello to all. Is everyone seeing me okay? I would like to first uh, do what I was obliged to do, and that is to disclaim that FGV uh, is not responsible for the opinions of our panelists or anyone speaking today. These are the opinions of the speakers themselves and not of the FGV. Is everyone okay with this? Our panelists? Thumbs up, Thais, thumbs up, all right. Okay, so welcome, good afternoon. Boa tarde a todos uh, from Rio de Janeiro. Um, my name is Gregory Mitchner. I'm a professor at uh, EBAPI, which is a Escola Brasileira de Administração Pública e Empresas. I'm just gonna do a very quick self-advertisement for our institution because Ibapi is the leading school of administration in Brazil, um, and it is also free to masters and PhD students, the academic masters and PhD that is, and the whole masters and PhD is in English. And that is one of the reasons why this uh, event is being held in English as well. So we are looking for applicants. If you know of anyone who would be interested in coming, we have one of the best political science associate, uh, political science departments, uh, public administration departments, and uh, business administration departments in Brazil, if not Latin America. No? So that's a little bit of advertisement for Ibapi. But I'd like to welcome, first of all, our panelists. No, we have uh, a varied bunch of experts on misinformation and information. Uh, Nina Santos, Tai Sebet, Luca Belli, Nara Pavon, and we have a discussant in Victor Piaia. And I'd like to give a special welcome to Anita Bruer, who's here from Germany and who is our keynote speaker and will share her experiences doing research here in Brazil on the issue of misinformation. She's gonna be our first speaker today. And she will perhaps also impart some of her findings from research in Mexico as well, which is an interesting comparative case. So I just wanted to preface uh, Anita's uh, keynote speech by uh, just talking very briefly about my own work on transparency, not my work per se, but just my interest in transparency and information and the media um, in general, have been with me since I began my master's degree in 2001, a long time ago. And so this topic fascinates me. I think the idea of an information ecosystem is fundamental. And it doesn't just involve social media and transparency, traditional media, and um, what's spoken in the street. It involves education and other elements of the information ecosystem as well. So I think that's important to remember. I also think it's important to remember that information, if we're talking about the big theme of today, which is backsliding or democratic recession or a million other terms used for this phenomenon that we're experiencing today, information is probably democracy's greatest advantage over authoritarian regimes in the sense that the free flow of information buoys and boosts the prosperity of markets and of governance in general, no? And so it's important to remember the fundamental aspect of information in our society. And I hope to get to these issues today. We're doing, obviously, the focus is on information and misinformation. So a lot of this focused on misinformation. But I think it's important to remember that misinformation has a hundred other names that go through the ages from propaganda to various forms of you know, error, um, ignorance, uh, transparency, opacity, et cetera. Um, so I'm gonna introduce Anita uh, very briefly, and then she's gonna go ahead with her keynote speech. And then after that, just to give you the structure of the talk today, what we're gonna have is we're gonna have four different thematic question and answers. Now the questions have already been given to the panelists, and so the panelists, each of them, with Victor being the discussant, each panelist is going to spend 10 minutes, timed 10 minutes, 10 minutes on the dot or less, uh, giving their 
response to pre-established questions that I'm going to read for you before each of you gets started. Okay, Vito, as our discussant, he's from the Escola de Comunicação e Media here, the School of Communication and Media here at the FGV. He's going to serve as a discussant, giving a very brief two to three minute commentary on what's been said, and then we're going to move forward with discussion among the panelists, but also inviting questions from the audience. And so I want to emphasize that we are expecting the audience to participate. Um, we are going to limit it to chat questions for now, which I'm going to moderate. Um, and so that is the format. We expect to go in four 30-minute blocks, thematic blocks. Now, what are these thematic blocks? It's about the socioeconomics of misinformation, the socioeconomic context. It's about the media context and the information ecosystem. It's about the politics, and then it's about the regulatory. And so those regulatory, politics, media, and socioeconomic are our four different uh, foci. Now, we're going to start with socioeconomic after Anita, then we're going to go on to media, politics, and finish up with regulation. Okay. So Anita, I'm going to introduce, she is visiting Ibapi. Um, she's a political scientist and senior researcher at the German Institute of Development and Sustainability, which is called IDOS, I-D-O-S. It's a research institution located in Bonn, Germany. She is currently right here right now working on the project Combating Autocratization and Polarization to Protect Democracy. And this is financed by the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, and she is currently working on a what's called the Prodigies Project, which is a scholarly exchange program among research institutions from eight countries on five continents that researches the impacts of digitization on society, governance, and democracy. And it is funded by the European Union. Now, Anita has published extensively on uh, protest movements, on misinformation, and she's already done research in several countries. So without further ado, Anita, do you want to go ahead and put your presentation up? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Greg, for the warm welcome. Mungin, you will compartir my presentation. Vamos. Está? Okay. Okay, uh, Greg, thank you very much for the warm uh, welcome. Thanks also very much again to FGV for acting as my host institution uh, during uh, my one month research stay here in Brazil and for making this uh, webinar possible. Um, just to set the record straight, I'm going to give a little keynote, uh, not talking about my research in Brazil, because I think this is what we have, our Brazilian experts for. I rather wanted to talk a little bit, uh, yeah, more to, to set the frame generally by talking about um, global um, trends. And I think that the that the topic we're talking about here today is very timely and important. Uh, but in fact, it has been for, um, oh, for quite a while, um, because ever since the internet became widely available to the general public, there has been a very strong interest by social and political science about its impact on societies and on democracy. But it is very interesting to see how quickly uh, such debates can change, because if we go back a decade, uh, let's say 2014, 2013, um, at that point, only about one third of the world population had access to the internet, but social media were gaining billions of users every month. And at that time, um, so there were still very high expectation in the internet. Um, so you could even say some sort of uh, cyber enthusiasm. So there were many who regarded it as or expected it to be some sort of liberation technology that had the power to, to topple autocracies, um, which was certainly partly motivated by, by the important role of um, social media in the Arab Spring uprisings. Um, there were expectations that would help to mobilize the political apathetic and that it would give voice to the voiceless 
and that it would make governments more transparent and accountable and interacting more with their citizenries and that it would help to drastically reduce uh, corruption. But then as time went by and more and more data became available, there was some sort of disillusionment as the internet failed to really match many of these high expectations. So long-term, um, the first long-term cross-national time series on the relation between internet penetration and democratic uh, growth showed that the internet had indeed a little positive impact or even negative impact on democracy. Um, similarly, if you look at um, the impact of social media use on political participation, there were numerous studies that found that the positive impact was very small and that the small uh, effects were uh, mediated by the usual suspects when it comes to political participation, that is income, education, discussing politics with friends and family and so on. So in a way, um, yeah, in, in this regard, uh, the internet had more of a reinforcing than an empowerment um, uh, impact. And so in a way as social scientists, we, we could say the internet really sort of uh, let us down. Now, fast forward a decade, and we are looking at a very different debate. And the reason for this um, paradigm change, so to say, is that we are in the middle of a third wave of autocratization. Uh, today, about 70% of the world's population live in autocracies and 42 countries are currently undergoing episodes of autocratization. However, uh, what is different this time from the first and second waves of autocratization that were characterized by sudden democratic breakdowns, you know, like through military coups, through invasions, through uh, autogolpes. This uh, current third wave is, is characterized by a creeping process of democratic backsliding, a gradual erosion of democracy from within, whereby democratic institutions that should function as uh, as checks and balances to the executive power come increasingly under, under attack. And also important civil liberties like freedom uh, of expression, the right to information are being increasingly curtailed in many countries. Now, and this is where um, today's topic of disinformation comes in because all of a sudden, the internet and social media have come under suspect to, to be the villain in this game and this development and to contribute or even catalyze uh, this development towards uh, authoritarianism. So global democracy indexes like the Bertelsmann Transformation Index or the Varieties of Democracy Project have identified disinformation, toxic levels of social and political polarization and autocratization as global trends that are occurring simultaneously. Uh, so the graph here, uh, which I've taken from the um, 2023 um, report of the Varieties of Democracy Project, the BDEM, uh, shows the development of digital information disseminated by governments on the left and the left box and polarization uh, on the right. And um, countries above the diagonal line are the ones where uh, government disinformation polarization have increased significantly over the past decade. And the countries that are colored red are the ones uh, which over the same period have been autocratizing. Now, as you can see, uh, Brazil is representative of this global trend um, although, yeah, maybe as a caveat here, so this was taken, as I said, from the 2023 uh, BDM report, uh, the 2024 BDM report was launched um, launched uh, last week on Wednesday, and very interestingly, uh, uh, Stefan Lindberg, uh, the director of the BDM project, opened the presentation uh, of the launch by saying that uh, Brazil stopped autocratization at the ballot, ballot box and turned it around, so maybe a little bit of premature statement. We can discuss it later on in this uh, webinar. But anyways, the question uh, is, however, how are disinformation, polarization, and autocratization related exactly? Are they reinforcing each other? Uh, which is first, which is second? You know, the hen and egg question, is there a sequence to this? So we really need to understand this interrelationship better. Uh, however, 
So to date or currently, whenever the question is being debated, what can be done to combat and prevent disinformation uh, and its negative, potential negative impact on democracy? The answer to this is often very simplistic. We need content regulation. But content regulation uh, is not necessarily a panacea in all contexts. And it might even be a threat uh, to freedom of expression and opinion in autocratizing contexts. So um, what is clear, however, is that the way in, in which disorder, disinformation and disorder in the information ecosystem arises is highly uh, dependent on context. And the logical conclusion uh, is that we need to understand this context. If we are to take action to prevent or combat um, disinformation effectively. So the basic assumption uh, that we want to discuss with you today, and as Greg already um, explained, this is how we have structured this webinar, is that there are essentially four different contexts or environments that need to be considered when we want to um, understand how disinformation emerges. So first of all, we have the social socio and socioeconomic contexts where we need to ask questions like, uh, what are the major conflict lines along which a society is drifting apart? Which social groups are able to use the internet and social media for their benefits? Which groups are marginalized or which groups are even being actively targeted by discriminatory uh, online hate speech? Then we have the media landscape where we uh, need to talk about what the media looks like in a country, if there is a plurality of opinions and voices, if there is balanced reporting on public life that contributes to a high quality of the public debate, uh, and how has digitalization impacted the quality of journalism more generally. Then we have the legislative and institutional context, very, very interesting from what I've seen and heard in Brazil so far. So here we need to ask, are there other laws in place to regulate online content uh, and who are the authorities in charge? And what about the flip side of disinformation? What are governments doing and what are the laws and regulations in place to ensure access to public information, quality, government data and transparency? And then large, lastly, of course, uh, the political context where we need to ask how do relevant political actors make use of the internet? What do their digital information and their digital communication strategies uh, and their online discourse look like? And only if we have a deeper understanding of how factors from these different contexts combine to contribute toward disinformation, only then can we devise measures to proactively protect democracy against the perils of disinformation uh, that actually fit uh, and make sense in the respective country contexts. And so, yes, I'm very much um, looking forward to having this debate with uh, five Brazilian experts on these topics and yeah, also exchange uh, first insights that I gained from my research in Brazil, maybe as Greg said, um, compare them a little bit to the experiences I made when researching the same topic last year in Mexico. And I'm very much forward, looking forward to our debate. Um, and Greg, okay. to That's back great. to you. Great, thank you, Anita. Excellent. And I'm sure there's questions, but we are not going to entertain those questions until we finish the first session, because otherwise we're going to get behind. So I'm going to introduce first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to go with the 10 minute timed response by Nina Santos to a socioeconomic question based question. I'm going to read first, introduce Nina briefly, then introduce the question. Nina will have 10 minutes timed i have a timer it's actually going to go off it's going to be noisy so you're going to hear the noise if you're still speaking it's going to go over your voice that's just how rude i am and then we will get uh, vito to give a little commentary okay so nina santos i'm going to give a very short bio is the director of the alafia lab coordinator of desinformaci which means essentially disinformer project and researcher at the National Institute of Science, Technology, and Digital Democracy, as well as the Center for Interdisciplinary Research and Analysis on Media. Centre d'analyse et de recherche interdisciplinaire sur les médias, right? All right, so that's all I'm gonna do, Nina, because otherwise it's gonna get too long. She's got all kinds of great um, bio lines to explore, but you can do that on the internet. 
So here is the question that I asked Nina, and then we will time the response, okay? So question, ready? In terms of social identity, where are the major social cleavages, conflict lines in Brazil? No. How have they evolved over the last year? And how are they affecting society, right, in terms of social cohesion and polarization? And how do they show up in the digital sphere? You have 10 minutes. Nina, take it away. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being with you here today and participating on the, this discussion. I anticipate that I won't be able to answer all of that in 10 minutes, but I will um, draw some lines that maybe can start a discussion and bring some elements to our to our conversation. So the first thing that um, I think is important when we think about the communication ecosystem and the social reality in Brazil or anywhere is that it's important to think that today we have an overlap of social structure and digital structure. So we have an overlap of social history, social culture, social inequalities, and a digital structure that brings new elements to that. It doesn't necessarily create, maybe sometimes it does, but it doesn't necessarily create new social inequalities, but it does bring new um, new logics to this phenomenon, economic and um, technological uh, functioning of this space that's going to overlap with this um, social structure and social inequality. That means that groups that are historically marginalized are at the center of the phenomena of digital harms both when we talk about disinformation or about hate speech, for example, women, black people, indigenous people are the most targeted and affected by this phenomena. That means that there are concrete effects to the lives of these people, normally uh, limiting or excluding them from spaces of visibility and power. So, we are talking about outcomes that are related to elections, to representation in institutional political sphere, but we are also talking about visibility and representation in the communication field, in the visibility sphere, in the public sphere, if you want. To fight and counter this um, reality, it's essential to understand that the new communication, uh, this new communication ecosystem, it's not only about a place where people communicate and get informed, but it's mostly about how people form their worldview. What elements do they use to decide what is important, what is happening, and what do they need to act upon? So I think we, when we look at this communication ecosystem, we have to acknowledge that people are seeing the world differently. And people are seeing the world different, differently today from before, but people are also seeing the world differently from one another. Because when we go from the mass media reality to the digital communication reality, we go through a process of diversific diversification, pluralization, but also a process of fragmentation of these different information sources. So on the one side, we do have new spaces, for example, for marginalized voices to appear and to enter this public arena, but we also have a very uh, intense fragmentation of these communication and information spaces. For example, in a research that I did in 2020, where I analyzed how people that were pro and against Bolsonaro uh, got informed at that moment in 2020, there was only a 30% coincidence in terms of information sources between these two groups, which means that more than 60% of the information sources were completely different. People were having access to different kinds of information from different information sources. These variations in terms of information consumption, 
are important in terms of gender, in terms of race, in terms of age, in terms of income and other um, social variables. And we have to also to consider that they vary not only in terms in social demographic terms, but they also become more intense when we um, acknowledge that in Brazil, as in several countries from the global south, the use of messaging apps is very intense, which means that the social relations, the social networks that form around each individual are absolutely essential to the way that they get informed. This reality is very um, preeminent here in Brazil, and it's very um, at the center of the debate that we have about our communication ecosystem, but it's also changing. So we are at a moment where I think um, we have a, an important change that we have to pay attention to. That is the fact that the messaging apps are now more and more incorporating um, tools of, let's say, large communication tools or mass communications to, tools such as channels, for example. Telegram is already known for um, having this use more related to big groups and channels than interpersonal communication. And now WhatsApp is going in the same sense at the same time where we also have a change in the major social media with more and more content coming from advertisement, which means that this communication space, this digital communication space that functions around digital platforms is connecting more and more people to content and not necessarily people to people. So I think we are at a moment where a shift is happening in this logic and it might affect our um, social reality. Our challenge in my view is to discuss um, the new term of the moment, information integrity, uh, considering the social structure and uh, not surrendering to techno-determinism, trying to put at the center of our debate, how do we integrate this, uh, the fight against these social inequalities with the fight against harms that come from these new technological structures. And it's very challenging to do that um, especially talking about a global discussion that is going on, because the local and regional contexts are very much important to consider what does information integrity mean. So I think an exercise that we all need to do is to think in our realities, in our countries, what are the elements that are essential to have a real democratic, diverse, plural, inclusive not communication space, but society, because society today includes the digital element. And what do we need from this new social reality to really have what is being called um, information integrity? I think these are some elements I would like to bring to the discussion and I will end before my 10 minutes so I can um, have maybe some more minutes later in our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nina. Huh? May I? So thank you, Gregory. Uh, thank you, Nina. Uh, are you listening to me? I I actually wanted to, I was, I was unable to take off my mute button for some reason. I guess someone's controlling so, it. <laughs> Okay, so case, take, I, I would just more... like to say, Nina, I'm very excited that you finished two minutes early. And I think what you had to say was a good start. Vito, go ahead. You have exactly three minutes maximum. And then we will launch into discussions. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you. Hi, Nina. Thank you very much for your brilliant presentation. Uh, I have uh, a lot of questions, but I will uh, reduce it. Uh, you told you recently published it. Uh, text criticizing the use of the term information integrity. And you say something very quick in your presentation. And I would like to ask you to develop more uh, your critic about the, the this concept and connect with the consequence that you see 
uh, that we, maybe we can uh, 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 suffer when we use, when we, re we read the reality and the, 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 the digital uh, questions and uh, issues uh, with this uh, concept. Uh, I, I would like also to just uh, uh, think about uh, when you talk about the social cleavages uh, related to uh, the usage of uh, social media and the digital political debate. When we do our research here at FGV, we see frequently that uh, different issues like uh, economics, environment, uh, unemployment, politics, and all the, the issues uh, are reframed in a logic of political polarization when they uh, start to be uh, discussed in social media. So it's the, the, the uh, instead of uh, fragmentate, we have a more, uh, uh, a less complex situation because different issues are reframed into uh, Bolsonaristas and uh, left. And I want to, ask you to talk a little bit more about how uh, we deal with fragmentation on one side and this uh, uh, simplification of the, uh, the, the perspectives about uh, some important and complex issues uh, we discuss that we discuss in social media. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for that, Vito. What we're gonna do is we're gonna let Nina respond very quickly, and then we're just gonna open it up to the panelists. And I'm gonna see if I can also take some questions from the audience. We have until uh, about 15 minutes to discuss this. So let's try to keep our comments, you know, sub two minutes if possible. Nina, do you wanna start? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Gregory, and thanks, uh, Victor, for the questions, and thank you for bringing up the discussion about information integrity that has been fascinating me. Um, what I try to, I mean, what I say mostly in the article that I publish and all the reflections that I have been doing about the term information integrity is that I, I started looking at it because it just, you know, from a moment to another, it became the new big thing uh, in Brazil, at least. And I, I would like to highlight that I'm talking about like someone that is regarding the phenomenon from Brazil. So, um, and then I started thinking, but where did it, where did this come from? And what does it really mean? I mean, how did we go from fake news to disinformation, misinformation, malinformation to information integrity, you know? And then uh, what I realized and what I think is problematic is that it's not that we, we're going from a term to another because that can be, you know, the the, matur the maturation of a process. But uh, the problem is that I think that we are here in Brazil, we are importing one term after another without necessarily reflecting upon it and trying to give uh, our um, definition to it. So, and we always have problems of translation. And when we translate, when we import a term, we are not only importing, you know, a term, a, a word or an expression, we are um, importing a mindset that is behind it, you know, a cultural history that is behind it. And um, I think since fake news, we have a problem of translation. We don't have a translation of fake news in, in Portuguese that works like noticias falsas is not fake news. There are several authors that already, you know, um, made this argument. And then we have disinformation, misinformation, malinformation that don't have translation. So everything is disinformação, which is not the same thing in English. And now we have information integrity, we, integrity which, is, which is translated mostly as um, integridade da informação, but also integridade informacional, but also integridade do ecossistema informacional. And um, and they don't mean necessarily the same thing. So I think we really, you know, need to stop and discuss what do we think. I mean, I acknowledge that we need to do this shift. It, it might be useful to do this positive shift. So let's stop saying that we are always all the time fighting against 
disinformation, fighting against hate speech, fighting against digital harms. Okay, we want to have a positive agenda, but let's give a real sense to it in, in the sense that we need to understand what do we want from a society that has a digital arena? What is a democratic society mm. that has a, a digital arena? So I think that's a little bit of the discussion that I try to do on the article and that I'm trying to, you know, talk with a lot of people to understand also what does it mean from the South, from Brazil, but from other countries in the global South to think about information integrity and to think about this positive agenda. I will let the second point about fragmentation and segmentation, that's what I was going to say, to the next round and we can continue the discussion. So Anita and then Luca, right? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nina, for your input. And uh, I'm very much in favor of positive agendas. So uh, thank you for that too. Uh, I have a question because, and this is something that I obviously have heard a lot about uh, since I'm here in Brazil. Uh, you were talking about women and black and indigenous people as vulnerable groups uh, that are being targeted in, in the digital sphere. And I wanted to know whether here we are talking more about, you know, a generalized uh, reinforcement of previously existing uh, stereotypes and prejudices through, you know, hate speech uh, in a decentralized manner, or uh, whether they have also been and have you also been seeing uh, really targeted disinformation campaigns uh, directed against uh, organized campaigns directed against one or several of these groups. And if that was the case, can they be traced back to certain actors or who are the agents um, behind this? And yeah, maybe this is also a question to Victor because I know that uh, this this is precisely what the Dapi Lab is uh, doing, like uh, monitoring and analyzing um, discourse on online platforms. So this would be my question to you. Thank you very much. And maybe we could go with Luca first. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I really, I very, I like very much what Nina was saying. And, uh, but I, there are a couple of points that I, I think uh, deserve being explored a little bit more. And uh, something that she was mentioning that, that actually social media are the main venue through which people are currently forming their opinion. I think that is a way of seeing it, but another way of seeing it is that actually they are the main venue through which people's opinion can be manipulated. And uh, it is. It, I think it would be uh, not necessarily completely correct to argue that people form their opinion independently uh, in social media as if uh, there was some sort of free market of idea where the best possible content and opinions prevail in a democratic Abermasian debates. Uh, it's very much a matter of what is artificially, algorithmically uh, prioritized uh, in face of the users so that they actually do not really independently form their opinion, but they form their opinions are formed based on the, the diet, the informational diet. Uh, customized informational diets that each social media proposes them according a to their interests, uh, meaning the users according to their profiles, or b the economic interests of the platform. And here, and a second point I wanted to stress because I also agree very much that uh, we don't really need necessarily to focus a lot on content, but on how content is spread and to which extent is directed to specific segments of the population. This is a point I will come uh, to discuss in, when I will have my 10 minutes uh, to speak about uh, regulation. It's the fact uh, that content that can be uh, obnoxious and, and, and distasteful or illegal is spread around millions of smartphones or billions of profiles is not a, a coincidence, it does not happen because of divine law. It happens because it is algorithmically organized and creates billions of profits for the corporations that 
organize it that way, uh, not only because of the commercial that can say, but the, the sort of positive feedback loop for them, because more the more engaging, the more outraging the content is, the more reactions there will be, so the more personal data there will be to refine profiles. And so it's, it's a win-win solution for platforms. So I think that an important point to bring into a discussion is not only about the content, and Nina was rightly saying, it's not only about the integrity of the information. It's a business model. It's a business model of large online platforms that precisely is based on maximizing profits from engaging content. And if the engaging content is positive content or obnoxious content, the money is always the same. So uh, the point is that the obnoxious content is frequently the most engaging is unless there is regulation that prohibits you from uh, spreading this intentionally, you can do it and earn huge profits for your shareholders. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this topic before we move on to the next? Because we could move on expeditiously and that way have more time for other discussions. Does anyone have anything else to say? And I'm not receiving any comments from the audience here. I've asked the FGV people exactly why this is. Uh, still waiting to hear back from them. But if you have comments, you can also send them to my email, if you prefer, which is gregory.michner at fgv.br. Um, okay. Anyone else? If I'm going to go going once, going twice, gone. Perfect. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to move on to our second sec session, which is on the media landscape. And in fact, I had the order wrong. So Luca, you're going to go third with the regulatory aspect. And then Nara, unfortunately, you're beetle bomb at the end. Um, but that doesn't mean that your, your talk is any less important. So the media landscape... Uh, will be given by Thais Sebet. Um, let me just find the uh, the questions here and introduce Thais very quickly. So Thais is a longtime journalist, has worked at several different media outlets. She's currently in Porto Alegre. I know you've worked for Zeta Ora, which I love. They've done a lot of work on freedom of information. Uh, she's director of operations at the public data agency Ficam Sabendo. If you don't know about Ficam Sabendo, which in English would mean in the know, I guess that would be the translation. Uh, I've been supporting them since day one. They've been doing excellent work on secrecy and freedom of information and other informational issues such as misinformation um, and open data. Uh, Thais is a professor of creative industries at the University do Valle do Rio do Sinos, Unicio, Sinos, as well as teaching in the MBA of Data Journalism at the Brazilian Institute of Learning, Instituto Brasileiro de Ensino. No? And so, Thais, we can find more about Thais on Google. I'm not going to introduce any more. Uh, I will say the question, though, that we asked of Thais just for the audience, and Thais is going to have 10 minutes to respond to it. So here we go. What do you think about both traditional and digital journalism in Brazil in terms of their quality, impartiality, and the diversity of opinions? Have there been recent developments that have impacted the quality and diversity of reporting? How has digital did, digitization impacted patterns of news consumption? And would you say Brazil is moving towards disorder in the information ecosystem due to increasing levels of dis disinformation? Now, if so, who are the main targets of this disinformation? Now, that's a lot of questions, Thais. So um, you are going to struggle to reach the 10-minute threshold, but you're going to do it. All right. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to share my point of view. I will try to answer your questions guiding by a main point. My main point is journalism is changing. My theoretical background is properly about it. I believe that we are in front of a structural change in journalism. We don't have a new paradigm yet, but the current journalist paradigm in which we remain when we ask for impartiality is in crisis. 
Um, I am referring to the information journalism uh, as an ideal type, according to Canadian experts Jean Charron and Jean de Bonville. They studied the structural change in journalism until the last century, creating a historical typology of journalistic practices inspired by Max Weber's ideal types methodology. In my PhD research, uh, I created my own ideal type to investigate uh, these structural changes in journalism in nowadays. The verification journalism is uh, my ideal type. I did it uh, exploring fact-checking practices as my empirical objects, but the characteristic of verification journalism as an ideal type served to explain changes in the ecosystem, in the ecosystem as a whole. Uh, the main point in the historical typology of journalism, according Chahon and Bonville, uh, is that the economic order determines journalistic content. When the ideal type of information journalism emerged, it happened because the media ecosystem changed, changed from a political background to an industrial production process. The news needed to become less involved in political issues to respond to commercial interests. Newspapers owners developed media outlets, outlets as a business. And in that context, journalists became professionals who were supposed to be impartial, just tell the events as they happen. The explanation is more complex but this summary is sufficient to introduce how I could answer the debate questions, uh, especially about journalists fighting disinformation. The rise of fact-checking practices as a journalistic response to contemporary challenges in information integrity is notorious, not only in Brazil, particularly uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic, where uh, journalists played a crucial role in verifying political content related to the virus on digital networks. These journalistic practice, as well data journalism, grew their relevance inside the journalist ecosystem and in society in general. In that period, social media platforms improve, improved their investments in partnerships with journalists and especially with international fact-checking network signatories in initiatives to help them highlight this information. And it changed the original profile of fact-checking. In the beginning, the main objective was to pay attention to politicians' speeches, to mark their mistakes and lies, to help citizens be better informed about their leaders and make them embarrassed to be more credible in their statements. The recent changes in the media ecosystem have brought new challenges. It is not sufficient to check politicians' speeches. The disinformation runs from multiple sources in multiple formats and with sharing strategies that are challenging for journalists to stop. And in fact, they can't stop the circulation because the key to content distribution is in the hands of social media platforms, not media outlets. So the economic order is on. Uh, to understand how fact-checking professionals perceive their journalistic practice nowadays, a group of colleagues from different countries and I applied a survey, a survey that revealed journalists' perceptions and principles in this practice. Last year, we published a paper uh, uh, presenting results about Brazilian journalists specifically. And I would like to share uh, some insights from this research. Uh, in fact, I will summarize seven topics to help us to discuss journalistic change in this media landscape. The first one, uh, the digital disinformation as the main concern. The primary purpose of fact-checking in Brazil is to detect and counteract false and misleading content across digital channels. This reflects a strong commitment among Brazilian journalists to uphold information integrity in the digital age. But not only that, this principle is stronger among international fact-checking network members. It inspires quotations about how this membership 
influence the selection of content to be fact-checked and how social media platforms will be behind this influence, considering the technical and financial support that major Brazilian verification media and media uh, at all receive from big technology companies. In other words, how are social media platforms or big techs modeling journalism nowadays? Topic two, transparency as a shared value. There is a strong consensus uh, among Brazilian fact checkers on the import importance of transparency. This includes openly presenting source and data that support the classification of content, which is considered fundamental to credibility and effectiveness of fact checking. Others research, for example, Brazilian journalists profile also shown that transparency is a principle strongly shared among journalists in general here in Brazil. Topic three, fact-checking as a non-partisanship practice. Journalists strive to maintain impartiality, ensuring that their work is not influenced by polit political bias, which is crucial in a highly polarized society. We understand that it is a complex insight because we are talking about journalists' perceptions. Outside the, the, the journalism ecosystem, other researchers reveal that citizens who identify ideologically with the right think that journalists are ideologically identified with the left and vice versa. I don't have time or data to reflect on this topic more profoundly now, so I am just leaving it on record that we understand the complexity behind this perception from journalists. Topic four, IFCN members have an advantage in digital tools to filter this information. The research indicates variations in the ease of using digital tools for fact-checking between IFCN members and non-members. This suggests that affiliation with the IFCN may provide fact-checkers with better access to resource and tools that can enhance their work. One face of this advantage is the existence of personalized tools to identify potential disinformation content provided by social media platforms to AFCN mem members that other media outlets don't have. Topic five, methodology. Regular fact checkers tend to be more cautious with their verification methodology and the use of veracity labels as opposed to occasional fact checkers who might have higher expectations to reveal inconsistencies by the verified actors. Topic six, polarization. The polarized, polarized political scenario in Brazil presents a new challenge for journalists. Their research suggests that fact checkers must navigate this environment carefully, balancing their role as watchdogs with the need to remain non-partisan. This practice has problems because when concerned about appearing impartial, maybe fact-checkers can force a balance when in fact one side of the debate can be more unfair than the other. Again, I can discuss this topic now. It is just a question to highlight about some problematic insights. Uh, and topic seven, the last one, fact-checking movements you the study explores whether there are differences in fact-checking practices based on the regularity of the activity, the experience of the fact-checkers and their age. These factors can influence how journalists perceive and engage in fact-checking. The fact-checking movement in Brazil is relatively young, both in terms of the media outlets involved and the journalists who are practicing it. This youthfulness may bring innovative approaches, but it also presents challenges in establishing trust and authority. In conclusion, journalists can help to restore order to Brazil's national information ecosystem by balancing viral content on social media with public statements from relevant actors and institutions. But we need more initiatives to encourage media literacy promote public transparency and regulate digital platforms. The next topic, right? Uh, the threat of sophisticated disinformation techniques like deepfakes and artificial intelligence tools 
which were an object of discussion in the new legislation for the next election in Brazil, is a big challenge for fact checkers and journalists in general. Also, the criticism aimed at the selection process of for fact checking and the current social perception of journalism democracy is a risk. However, even if you probably do not read a fact checking piece about the right disinformation you were exposed to, I believe that fact checking content is necessary to index this information in the digital ecosystem. If no one checks anything, this information circulates without a counterpoint. When you have journalistic archives with trusted methods and practices associated with media literacy measures, transparency campaigns, and platform regulations, it is possible to direct reliable content to citizens interested in it. Restoring information order, as we already know, is not a task that can be solved with a single measure. Fact-checking is one of them, journalism is one of them, and I am referring another journalist, not exactly this one in which we remain when we ask about impartiality. I don't know how the new journalistic paradigm will be uh, or when this changing process will be complete, but I am sure that we are witnessing a structural change in the journalism ecosystem. And so thank you. That's it for two time. Thanks very much, Thais. Vito, do you want to go ahead and provide a quick discussion? Perfect. Thank you, Gregory. Thank you, Thais. Uh, two brief questions. Uh, recently, we have seen a uh, growth of entertainment pages in digital uh, platform, which have gained a lot of relevance in the digital environment. And these pages were uh, very important in 2002 elections in Brazil, and they have millions of followers on different platforms. And it's uh, interesting because these pages uh, claim uh, clearly that they don't do any kind of verification. They just uh, reply to what uh, traditional journalists' uh, vehicles uh, publish it. Uh, I'd like to hear you about your impression of this phenomenon, which is not uh, which not happened only in entertainment pages, but also uh, in local uh, in in local media uh, vehicles and all sm other small pages in social media, and how. And uh, so I would like to hear you about your impressions of this phenomenon and how it relates to the transformations in contemporary journalism. Uh, and the second question is uh, one of uh, the trends I see in professional journalism uh, and even the fact check agencies is the attempt to be more uh, analytical than descriptive. Uh, on one hand, this creates a clear differentiation between the quality and the deep of traditional journalism work uh, and the inform informal mediations that we know in digital public arena. Uh, on the other hand, it seems to me that this put journalism, journalism in the target of polarization and political polarization dispute on social media. So how do you see this issue? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Uh, your first question um, opened a, a door to explain a little more about uh, historical typology from uh, Charon and Bonville. Because after information journalism that they identified uh, in the 20th century, uh, in the final years uh, of the 20th century, they identified uh, a change. Uh, directioning um, journalism to a, another uh, paradigm uh, called communication journalism. And this communication journalism is properly about entertainment. They, they uh, put attention in uh, the, the changing in the journalism content, uh, directioned, how can I say, to uh, dialogue, you know, the, the impartiality or objectivity the, that it is a, a complex uh, notion, objectivity, 
But uh, this uh, principle uh, was negotiated to entertain, to, to, to be more uh, uh, in, in a sense of uh, subjectivity, because journalists in new channels and the, the interesting, the, the inter one interesting point in the uh, Charron and Beauville uh, historical typology is they positioned it, this um, change in the final of the 20th century, not the beginning of 21st century, you know? So uh, digital uh, landscape is out of their work. They were uh, talking about, for example, segmented uh, channels on TV. When the uh, journalists are not journalists, but um, uh, anchors, uh, I, le I lost the, the word now, but the Anchor. presenters, anchors, the same, thank you. The anchors on TV needs to be more uh, free to dialogue with their audience. So this is one of the, the transformation. And well, when I uh, um, create my uh, ideal type journalism of verification, I was uh, trying to reflect about another transition. So we are in the middle of the transition. So of course, uh, entertainment, communication journalism is a reality we are in the middle of the, the, the transition. And, but the point is for journalists, for journalists, the verification concern is a principle different from communication. So in my opinion, it is my point of view, I am studying these uh, changes. Uh, the um, definition of the professionals, the profession, uh, is more um, related to verification than communication. But of course, the ecosystem uh, is um, one, uh, just one. We have the, the two paradigms, paradigms in the same time. Anita, do you want to go ahead? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Taish, for these uh, insights into yeah, yeah, changing paradigms of, of journalism in, in Brazil. Uh, I mean, this is something that I have also heard uh, while doing research here, you know, that to start with, uh, Brazil has never been a country of newspaper readers, uh, so that, you know, numbers of printed newspapers in circulation were always low, but then with digitalization, really, uh, the financial uh, viability of newspapers has been very negatively affected through digitalization. And, and this has uh, at the same time uh, led to a precarization of journalists in Brazil, who in the past, you know, the majority of them were registered with a newspaper uh, receiving social benefits. And nowadays, most of them are freelancers uh, that have to work several jobs on the side. What, what I would be interested in learning is how, if we're talking about changing paradigms of journalism, how digitalization has affected relationships between the government or governments and uh, and the media, uh, the press um, in Brazil. Because I mean, uh, like how have governments communication strategies changed? Because traditionally, you know, you would have a government speaker uh, and and the occasional press conference uh, as the as the communication channels and then the media as and that's why they call that way you know as the mediators who will transmit that information to the general public uh, and I would like to know whether digitalization has led to a situation where the traditional media is more and more being circumvented uh, governments uh, trying to use social media themselves. Uh, maybe helped by professional companies uh, in order to target uh, audiences directly. And also importantly, if, if we can observe um, differences maybe between the past Bolsonaro government and uh, current Lula government in that respect and you know, how they differ in their um, digital communication strategies.
I'm going to let people debate as you will. I'm not going to have to moderate every single interaction here. So you guys go ahead. There's only six of us here, uh, seven rather. So please go ahead. Thais, do you want to respond? And then Nada, do you want to chime in? Well, uh, in fact, we have, um, um, we don't have exactly a difference in the communication, in the strategy communication, uh, if we consider the direct channel that govern, government has uh, uh, with the public, you know, they don't need media outlets to communicate with the public. But of course, if we analyze the, the content, the discourse from one government and another, maybe we can uh, percept uh, difference. But uh, I just uh, took this, this, this piece of your uh, considerations, Anita, because uh, this is one of the, um, how can I say the 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 points that uh, north the chains because media outlets are in another position in the debate. We are not more the mediators. Uh, the information already is there, already is public, and the journalists need to uh, analyze this information and organize this information, and it includes verify this information. So this is the, the main point in the observation of a possible new paradigm, because media outlets are not more uh, mediators, as you said, you know, uh, between governments or institutions and uh, the society. And it is a, a new challenge because, uh, well, they, they can communicate directly and they can uh, question the methods of traditional journalism or digital journalism, but this uh, journalism uh, concerned about the principles to uh, the profession. I don't know if I, uh, I am being understand. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, so, Thais, thank you very much for um, for your contributions. I just wanted to mention um, the results of two different studies that I conducted that kind of speak to some of the ideas that you brought, right, and talks a lot about the role of professional journalism and the kind of fight against misinformation or in building, you know, uh, more integrity in our kind of informational market, right? So, in 2018, we conducted a study during the presidential elections trying to assess the effectiveness of fact-checking, right? Because we noted that most of the efforts to fight misinformation were coming in the form of fact-checking, right? And most of the resources were going to towards fact-checkers. And um, we had evidence from the Global North that fact-checking uh, was effective, was an effective tool for fighting misinformation. But we had absolutely no evidence in the global south uh, as to, you know, whether this strategy would be effective. And, you know, there are major differences in terms of, you know, education, the media e ecosystem, you know, between the global north and the global south. So we had reasons to, you know, think to, to, to be more skeptical, right, about the role of fact checkers. And this is precisely what we found. We found we conducted three different studies. Those were randomized experiments, and we find that fact checking um, uh, w w was not effective at, at kind of, you know, kind of preventing people from believing in misinformation. And, and it was so interesting because fact-checking would fail across the board. It failed to correct information that people wanted to be true, which was, you know, like, so kind of politically aligned information that you kind of, you know, wished would be true. And then you had fact-checking kind of, you know, uh, we had this fact-checker check the information. People would still not, you know, change their opinions about it. So, um, so that was the first piece of evidence that made uh, you know that I think it, t it tells a lot about our uh, ecosystem and perhaps you know this kind of baseline levels of trust in media and things that I think we should consider. The other, and then we were kind of you know very um, 
disappointed at these findings, right? That, you know, the main strategy for fighting misinformation did not work in Brazil. And then we decided to test a different strategy. So instead of, because corrections come after exposure to misinformation, right? Necessarily, you were first exposed to it and then you got the information checked. And there's also evidence that once you try to correct something, people become familiar with that information. So the effect back backfires, right? So anyway, we decided to test a different strategy it would be more related to the role of professional journalism. And we partnered with Folha de São Paulo in a study during the 2020 municipal elections. And we, instead of looking at the role of fact-checking, we tried to see whether, um, you know, an inoculation strategy would work. So we kind of basically gave information on how to, you know, uh, we basically trained people on how to recognize fake news. You know, we kind of raised the salient, we tried to raise the salience of the issue, right, to make people more concerned about the environment, the informational environment, and make, make them more aware, right, that they might come across fake news and things like that. And that strategy really worked. And it was great because we did partner with, you know, kind of, you know, Folha de Sao Paulo, which is kind of a very old newspaper. And uh, they gave them, they gave study participants vouchers to access their content to as part of the experiment. And the effects we found were so big that we, as researchers, we didn't believe in the effects. So we replicated the study and we found consistent consistent results, right? So basically, in terms of thinking of the role of professional journalism, I think, you know, uh, and, and, and I'm going to say something about fact-checking too, because I think it's important. But, you know, the idea is that, um, uh, you know, we need to train people and educate people and inoculate them against misinformation rather than just, you know, trying to correct the information after exposure. Uh, but, Having said that, I think fact-checking might not be a, an effective tool to fight uh, misbeliefs or to change misbeliefs, but I agree with you that, you know, it's 100% sure to have, you know, a reliable way of separating what is true, what is not, and, you know, basically a pattern, right, and, and, and a baseline to evaluate, you know, the information that it's out there. So, but it's not, basically, I think the role of fact-checking is not what we expected that you would be. Thank you, Nara. I totally, I, I totally agree, in fact, because, uh, as I said, probably you don't, uh, you don't read uh, a fact-checking uh, properly about uh, fake news that you were uh, exposed to. And this point, because the, the uh, convictions of the, the, the people, you, you, you cannot uh, destroy it. But uh, I am, uh, in fact, I am uh, working in a new research uh, uh, to investigate this point. I believe in the power of index, you know, uh, we need to index this information. This, uh, in my point of view, uh, could be a, a new um, work to journalists in this age uh, to index this information, because when we uh, work together in fact-checking and media literacy, one of the lessons we share is uh, search by other source, you know, search uh, for a good source to confirm uh, information, to, to check information by yourself. To check information by yourself is possible with public transparency too, but uh, public uh, data frequently are uh, complex. To, to normal people understand, you know. Uh, so in this case, journalists can be mediators. They can uh, uh, make easier the, the, the work to check information if they uh, index this, um, this information in the ecosystem. This is my point. I, I totally agree that uh, the effectiveness of fact-checking uh, directly to the, the the people exposed to this information is not confirmed. Uh, we don't have this evidence. But uh, thinking about the the journalism uh, professional um, work, I think this is uh, one of the the main concern 
not not me, <laughs> the journalists that um, answered our uh, survey, uh, they agreed that um, digital uh, disinformation concern is their uh, more um, uh, commitment nowadays. I, I thank, thank you very much for this. Um, I would have uh, yet another question around this whole topic of uh, fake news and, and fact checking. And Greg, because you had asked me to, to bring in some insights uh, from my research in, in Mexico. And um, what I saw there or what occurred there is that, you know, this whole terminology of fake news and fact checking was so to, yeah so to say um misappropriated and twisted around by uh the government of Andre, uh, andres manuel lopez obrador uh so that um for instance in his uh in his in the press press conference that he holds every morning uh, there was a dedicated section called um I think in, in Spanish is quien es quien de las mentiras. I think uh, that's understandable in Portuguese too. Uh, who is who in lies of the week, uh, where he would expose journalists who have been critical of him and accusing them of, you know, having lied and 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 uh, falsified facts. And there was also a, a government page uh, called Infodemia, which allegedly had the task of uh, revealing. And, and, and rectifying fake news. Uh, but then uh, a, a journalist collective got to work on, on, on this site and said that most of the information that was provided there was uh, could be proven to be misinformation. And regarding um, this this uh, section of who is who in lies, quien es quien las mentiras, uh, in, in the presidential press conference, uh, he was actually... Um, asked by uh, the Special Rapporteur of Freedom of Expression of the Inter-American uh, Creative Human Rights to, to stop this session because it had a massive you know, negative uh, impact also on the security of, of journalists who, who were um, uh, being attacked in this section. Uh, and so what I would like to see, to know if we have seen anything similar in Brazil, you know, like this massive uh, delegitimization um, of fact checkers, uh, of journalists, or or the government itself misappropriating this terminology uh, of fake news and, and and fact checking. Yes, we had we have the same situation, especially in the uh, last government. We had many uh, situations with persecutions uh, um, to journalists and fact checking too. Nara mentioned uh, about trusting media. Uh, fact checking suffered the same nowadays in Brazil, the same um, uh, untrusting in, in media, you know, because uh, uh, in, in one of uh, influencers uh, about this uh, constantly uh, exposed. Uh, um, I mean, um, this, my English is, is <laughs> failing. Um, eu vou responder em português. Isso, vou responder em português, porque agora complicou meu raciocínio aqui. Mas uh, essa campanha de uh, questionar o jornalismo e questionar o fact-checking foi muito puxada no último governo. É, a gente tem um clima um pouco mais ameno agora. Mas a campanha continua né, também expondo tanto jornalistas quanto fact-checkers uh, nesse mesmo caminho aí de uh, não credibilidade e claro que isso compromete o resultado. Great. Ok, we are one minute uh, late, which is very good, obviously. So, thanks very much for being on time, everyone. We were supposed to have a five minute break right now, actually 10 minute break. Um, I think that's up to you. What do you say? Do we do that or do we just keep going? And then people will take off as they need to take off. Um, should we take the break? I guess we should, it's in the schedule.
I'm just afraid of losing the few viewers that are left, but um, I guess we will. So we will go come back at 3.30 then, okay? Which is in nine minutes or eight minutes, according to my time here. See you in a minute. Thank you. See you in a bit. See you in a minute.
Okay. We are Hello, back. everybody. Welcome back. All right, indeed. Anita, so we are going into our third session, um, and that is going to be the regulatory and institutional context. And so we're going to have Luca Belli speak, who is from our very own FGB Rio de Janeiro from the School of Law. Luca Belli is a professor of law in the undergraduate program and permanent faculty member of the graduate program in law and regulation at FGV Rio. And he's a lecturer in the LLM program in law, innovation and technology at also FGV Rio Law. Um, and he is the director of the Center for Technology and Society and a collaborator of mine. So uh, I'm just gonna welcome Luca and also repeat the question that was asked to Luca for his 10 minute presentation. So here's the question. What are the most effective laws for combating disinformation and regulating content? And how do they compare with international standards or those of other countries? What has been the reaction among the public to legislative changes? And to what extent has the public been involved in these developments? Are those in charge of supervising online content agencies and internet companies sufficiently funded and independent? Take it away, Luca. Yeah, thank you very much, Greg. And uh, yeah, I think that to reply to your questions, uh, it is, there are three points that I would like to stress. First of all, uh, what is uh, the current wave of regulation trying to tackle as a problem? And then we can discuss whether uh, the current models that are proposed are uh, able to do it effectively or not. And then, uh, then I want to enter into what I would call as a sort of elephant in the room, which is a major problem that uh, so far, I don't want to say that no regulation is tackling. A lot of regulation could be tackled, but no one is implementing such regulation effectively. And that will be my second point. But uh, let's first start with a little bit of context. So uh, the first wave of regulation we had in the late 90s, early 1000s, were really based on uh, really content moderation, right? notice and takedown, uh, identifying content that it violates certain criteria and take it down. Uh, but that is a sort of old school uh, vision of media. Uh, I, I, I publish something that is identified as label, uh, you have to withdraw it and ask an excuse. That is how media well, still function, but most of media, all media function in the, in the 20th century. And uh, somehow our early social media function where people were, let's say communities were limited in scale. And even what you what users were seeing in their timelines was really limited in scale. So the fact of uh, identifying content and taking it down could be somehow effective in fighting uh, content that you didn't you didn't want to to, to, to spread widely. But that uh, with the scale of social media, with the enormous scale of social media, they started to acquire in the two thousands. Uh, it it easily and quickly became very ineffective to uh, use the literally reverse chronological criteria that was used in time timeline were really timeline so the content you you were as a user you were seeing was the uh, the, the 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 least uh, the, the most recent content published by by your friends but if you have 15 friends that may work if you have 15,000 friends or 1,500 friends, this will not work. So it became essential from an, an organizational perspective, but also a commercial one, to start to recommend algorithmically content. What does it mean? The, the content that we see is not the most recent. It's the one that has been selected to be the most recent for us, the most relevant for us. So it's selected about uh, taking into consideration our profile, and the criteria that the specific social media company includes as its commercial priorities, right? So what 
I publish on any social media I'm a user, it's uh, useless. It's invisible compared to the universe of content that is published every second. But other people see it simply because an algorithm uh, thing that someone else can be interested, or maybe <laughs> if, if I am a commercial user, I'm paying for my content to be seen. Or uh, maybe there is any other consideration, any other criteria embedded in the algorithmic recommendation, right? So the last, uh, the last generation of regulation we are seeing take, aims at taking, taking this transparency and explainability of algorithms and creating a system that makes this somehow effective, right? So if you take the uh, gold, so-called golden standard, uh, the Digital Services Act of the European Union, it, 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 the Article 27, it creates an obligation to uh, transparently explain what the recommender system uh, imply, which criteria are utilized. And then there is an even, an even more interesting one that is only for uh, so-called blobs or uh, the very large online platforms, which is a very interesting, peculiar acronym, or also very large search engines, which they all also have to create an option for user not to receive content according to the profile, but uh, to switch to a non-algorithmically -recomm recommended version, right? And this is the, 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 the regulatory tool that currently, one at least, two of the regulatory tools that current uh, 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 legislators are proposing or trying to implement in order to uh, withdraw to, to, to reduce the, the enormous power that large uh, uh, tech enterprises have on entire populations, right? Now, the pr first problem is that to implement this, it's, it, it is already very difficult to approve this in, in a legislature. It's even harder to implement it, right? And actually, a, a very interesting example comes from Brazil, where since 2020, there is a bill in, sitting in Congress, uh, having been altered in multiple iterations, the so-called fake news bill, bill uh, 2630 of 2020, that tries to introduce some of these transparency criteria, but that was actually withdrawn from debate. The latest version was withdrawn from debate in the Congress in, last, in early May 2023 because of the very intense lobbying of mostly tech platforms large social media and large uh, online platforms and also several political actors. And even with a, a very watered down version that was completely excluding the creation of, of an independent authority that would have implemented the law, this was withdrawn from debate because it would have been a, a gigantic failure for the government, right? No, it was not going to pass, right? Why? Because there is an enormous uh, opposition to this from a very concentrated uh, economic and political power centers. And even without a, 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 an oversight regulator in the bill, this was not going to pass. Now, without a very well-resourced regulator that can implement this and actually understand what the criteria of algorithmic uh, regulation transparently uh, disclosed by, by by platform mean, this is meaningless. So the fact of having regulation trying to provide transparency on algorithmic uh, uh, system that prioritize on or downgrade content in our timeline, this is a very good in principle, but if you don't implement this effectively, it's completely useless. And then let me enter into the second point, which I think is the most pernicious one, especially in most global South countries. In most global South countries, so first, let me reiterate, the fact that the, the, the idea of algorithmic recommendation is to concentrate attention of users in, in, on what is uh, useful for them or what is useful for the platform in, term, in commercial terms. Now, if users were free to choose whatever platform and service they want, this would be made, the regulation that I just mentioned could solve ideally the problem. Now, in most, it happens that in most global South countries, people.
Is it is it just me? I can't. I think, it's, Luca, I think we've muted. lost Lucas sound. Luca, Luca, you Luca, muted your you're phone. You're mute. You're a mute. Oh, sorry. You're not can mute you hear, for can you hear me now? Yeah. Can, sorry, I was you've waiting. only got you've only got you've already passed, so we got two minutes left. Okay, I will I will I will quickly uh, I will quickly wrap up. So the the second point, very important point, is that in most global South countries, internet access is primarily through mobile internet, and in most global South countries, only social media are only access to social media, especially social media in the Meta group, WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram is provided for free, is subsidized, whereas all the rest is extremely expensive. So if having access to everything online costs you 20% uh, of your salary, no one, in uh, considering that most global South population is poor, no one will have the resources to buy access to the internet. Everyone, actually there are good data uh, from a survey made by IDEF in Instituto Locomotiva in 2021, 80-25% of the Brazilian population uses these prepaid plans where very few applications are subsidized, typically social media, and all the rest is uh, very expensive because you have very limited data caps, very limited data allowance. So pe most people are poor and most people will stay three, four hours per day only on social media. So you may have the best regulation, the, co the best content regula regulation in the world, but if people stay only on social media, they will keep on being brainwashed by what social media feeds into their mind for three or four hours per day. I'm uh, stopping here and le le leaving the rest of my consideration for the debate. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Luca. Vito, would you go ahead and provide some commentary? Yes, thank you. Thank you a lot, Luca. Very interesting reflections. Uh, I just have one uh, reflection. Uh, last year, we did uh, several studies here at the School of Communication on digital public debate on uh, PL 2630. And as I mentioned to Nina, uh, it was very impressive how in just a few days, the discussion was completely reframed based on the political polarization between Lulistas and Bolsonaristas. Uh, just to give you uh, some context, uh, the debate was uh, reborn in the context of the terrible attacks on schools that took place at the end of March and the beginning of April of 2023. And, and we have, uh, I don't know, one day of consensus or something like that. Uh, and then the conflict uh, speeches emerged, focusing the idea of a censorship law. Uh, as someone who is familiar with different regulatory bills around the world and is working uh, directly on building a proposal that is suitable for the Brazilian context, I'd like to hear uh, to, from you, uh, what elements do you think uh, they could help form a more uh, favorable perspective to debate this on digital public debate in general. Uh, what kind of, uh, 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 I don't know, the transparency you, you told uh, that is very important, but what we can uh, uh, stress in uh, our communications uh, to, to create a more uh, feasible uh, uh, and, I don't know, easy context to debate this uh, in digital public debate. Thank you. Yeah, again, I think that when one has to analyze this uh, issue, it is it is not possible to only look at content. As Nina was mentioning before, I was very much agreeing because it's not only a matter of regulating content is pla on platforms. It's really a matter of regulating or understanding how eyeballs how attention is concentrated into smartphones, right? So again, the first preliminary step, even before regulating uh, platforms, would be uh, implementing the law that already exists actually in Brazil and in most other countries that prohibits to favor specific, have favorable treatment for specific applications, right? In Brazil, it's 10 years old next month, Marcos Vilda Internet, uh, law uh, 12,895, 
that in Article 9 prescribes the non-discriminatory treatment, uh, non-discriminatory treatment of all application services and content. So the fact that uh, that uh, that uh, uh, internet access providers, telecom operators, give for free only selected applications. This could be easily considered illegal. Uh, actually, it would be considered illegal if uh, the antitrust regulator in 2017 had not considered this legal. Uh, but there have uh, we have had a lot of evidence, mounting evidence, including the report that was published a few years ago. And now I'm very happy. Also, I've heard that uh, the Anatel, the telecoms regulator, is doing another study on this precisely to produce more evidence on the fact that actually meaningful connectivity, the fact that you can have access to everything, it's only a, an elite privilege in Brazil. Uh, 80 to 85 percent of the population only has access to social media. So if you have uh, most of the population that unfortunately is uh, less wealthy and also less educated, uh, brainwashed daily by uh, the having access only to the main vectors of propagation of fake news, this is already a non-starter, right? We had we did research here at the CTS, uh, some colleague of mine did research last year on e-commerce, and uh, uh, Brazilians spend more than upper, the three hours and a half per day on social media, right? Think about all people that commute to work. Uh, if, you are, don't, if you cannot pay for all the internet, you will stay three, four hours per day in a bus or in a train looking at social media, right? So if you don't solve that, you don't solve uh, fake news uh, and misinformation in Brazil. With regard to uh, content regulation, I think that transparency would be uh, very useful. But again, transparency for whom? Who is able then to uh, understand what kind of criteria you use in the algorithmic uh, uh, recommendation and how to understand if, whether they are uh, discriminatory, correspond to legal uh, norms or not? Which kind of regulator? Uh, could do this. The judiciary is uh, uh, totally unfit to do this evaluation, not only in Brazil, in every country of the, country of the world. This is why uh, sectorial regulation and regulators is, is created. Uh, but even, in, even there, you have, uh, uh, if you don't have meaningful transparency, meaning that you, 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 you explicitate which kind of uh, criteria, which kind of, which, which kind of process, and how information have to be shared is very difficult for the regulator to have the intellectual and uh, uh, budget resources to be able to go after uh, Google and Facebook, right? And last but not least, I think honestly, the most underappreciated but most useful uh, provision that uh, recent regulations like Digital Services Act brought, the fact that to oblige platform to also create a non-algorithmically recommended version of the service and to allow users to switch to that uh, uh, version. And that could be even used in case of election to oblige platforms to have that as a default so that people are not constantly fed what billionaires pay mo the most to have in their minds, but they are fed what they I find interesting according to their uh, essentially essential profile, their true profile, their their interests, not what other people suggested. Just to conclude, a very important piece of data: uh, the, the Facebook own research demonstrates that sixty percent of people that join extremist group on Facebook do it because the extremist the extremist group pages are recommended to them, not because they want it. So if you want to, uh, I don't want to, want to say solve, but mitigate the problem, you have to adopt a lot of uh, different solutions and only looking at the content is maybe not the most uh, effective one. Go ahead, ladies, go ahead. Okay, I will. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you very much, Luca, for this. Uh, passionate uh, argument and uh which I like because uh I, I like sometimes I'd like to to be contradicted and it's interesting uh because what you just said is is very interesting to another 
colleague that I happened to interview here uh, in Brazil. And when I presented my, you know, my analytical framework to that to him and my argument that, you know, interventions or measures to combat to combat um, disinformation needed to be uh, tailor made to to national or to local contexts, he said, "Well, oh, I only agree to fifty percent." with you because big part of the problem is uh, is a global one. And it's simply uh, the measure here is very clear, preference-based uh, algorithmic recommendations need to be banned because this is what drives effective polarization. Because yeah, unfortunately, uh, this is something that, you know, resonates with human nature because people, users want to look at what upsets them, or at least they tend to look longer at content uh, that upsets them. And this is then automatically you're shaping your own uh, algorithm there. And you look at content uh, that, you, that you are opposed to, and, and this is what drives uh, societies apart. And the other the other point that you raised, I think also a very valid one, uh, the fact that, yeah, I had actually coming from the global north, never really thought about it. I was aware that this existed in many countries here in the global south. Uh, you know, these prepaid WhatsApp plans uh, where you just get access to to social media. And I think the problem here is not so much with these applications uh, brainwashing you, because it's not the applications that produce the content. But the the problem then here is that you get stuck in these in these echo chambers. You know, and as we as human human beings uh, tend to be hom to towards homophily is that we are stuck there with people that are like minded and that way we are only exchanging views with people that are like minded and become to perceive of these perceptions as the perceptions of the dominant majority and hence the truth. I mean, I can, I've been myself uh, a victim to this echo chamber effect and I remember it very vividly uh, when the elections, uh, when, yeah, Trump, uh, uh, during the electoral campaign of Trump. And I was saying like, that's ridiculous. That guy will never win. It doesn't stand a chance in hell. Well, why did I think so? Because all of my American friends on online platforms were like, you know, liberal minded and would have never voted for him. And so it, very much to my surprise what actually happened. So we very easily fall victim to that effect. And it's a it's a huge problem. Nina, go ahead. Thank you. Um, it's such amazing. It's amazing to listen to you Luca because there are so many things that resonate with what I do and what I have been discussing and I would like to um to intervene and talk about um remembering the previous discussion that we were having about people forming their opinion online which I think has very much to do also with algorithm algorithm recommendation as Anita was talking about and when you you talked after um after my speech you said that um social media could be seen also as the venue where um people's opinion are manipulated and i very much agree with you not not in the sense that i think that people's opinion are being manipulated all the time but in the sense that they can be manipulated i don't see social media as an independent space where people form their opinion but as one more layer that's going to dialogue with other layers of our social interaction and people are going to form their opinions through them. I mean, if we think about, you know, the reality of the pandemic where everybody was in theory at home and very much, you know, restricted to the, the home environment and the online environment, it was much more powerful, powerful than when we really have a life outside of our homes and we you know we encounter people at schools at work and at other places and we read uh things that are happening outside of the digital world so i think it's just one more layer and one thing um that i would like to you know maybe propose or share and see if it resonates with you is that when this discussion about the structure of digital platforms when I think about it, it, 
in terms of the regulatory framework or disinformation spread or any of these phenomena that we are trying to tackle, including journalism. I try to think about, I, I have been thinking about it in with the metaphor of a supermarket as like the digital platforms would be, you know, not the ones that are putting the products in the shelves, but they are, they are the ones that are deciding, you know, the opening hours, the closing hours and where each product goes. So which product goes in the higher shelf that nobody's going to see or in the very lower shelf that, you know, you have to kneel down to see and what is in, in front of our eyes, except that um, what digital platforms are able to do is also to provide very personalized supermarket to specific people or to specific groups of people. So that has been a metaphor that I have been using to help me think about the regulatory framework and also the uh, information dynamics that happens through these platforms and how should we deal with it and try to tackle the harms that emerge from it. So it would be great to hear from you about that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that the, 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 the supermarket metaphor is a good one, uh, but uh, the, I mean, mostly many social media space, they really act also as enormous amplificators. So the, the, the huge, the, one of the main risks, what they are called systemic risks with online uh, social media platform, they, they happen because of the scale, the, 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 the speed and the breadth of social media. So. Although yes, I think that uh, social the, the, thinking about platforms as as a uh, supermarket is generally a, a a good metaphor. Some of them, and that is, I think, why the uh, European Union or also other systems uh, have considered uh, asymmetric regulation, where you you regulate uh, differently if you are uh, Google or if you are a start a startup because. Uh, Although both, to some extent, they could be uh, considered as uh, supermarkets, if you want. One is like Walmart, and the other is the grocery store at the corner of your home. So it, it, it's very different the way, the kind of uh, impact that a decision of an enormous actor may have. Uh, and also the, 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 the speed of it, the, the fact that, uh, you know, for instance, in Brazil, what is uh, the kind of content regulation that it, regime that currently exists means that content that may be legal uh, or some type of content can be removed only with a court order, which has, has been thought as a very, uh, in good faith, as something that would protect freedom of expression and prevent censorship. But de facto, we did research a couple of years ago, and de facto, to have a court order, it takes on average nine months. So if you have people like happened last year in Brazil in March 2023 uh, calling for uh, fanatics to go in kindergarten and kill kids because they celebrate uh, the Columbine anniversary, I mean, in, in so, with the, the scale of social media, it means that there are also there is also a large majority of special people with very particular ideas and someone that thinks that organizing killing children to celebrate another murder's event uh, is allowed to freely speak and organize. That is really not a, what freedom of expression is about, right? Uh, it's uh, it, the fact that you have emergency breaks to be able to uh, stop this kind of phenomena to, 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 to happen. Uh, I don't only want to speak about fanatics, but also like terrorists organizing to uh, uh, violent and, and pro uh, protests against specific groups. Uh, this you have to have to be able to have emergency breaks to uh, mitigate what otherwise would be a, a time bomb. So it's uh, it, I, I understand. I'm very much sympathetic with uh, to freedom of expression arguments, but. Uh, Freedom of expression has limits everywhere in the world. Uh, even in very liberal United States, try to publish something about that violates copyright, 
and then you will tell me if you don't immediately realize uh, if there are no limitations to uh, freedom of expression. So uh, freedom of expression has been limited for specific reason uh, through history. And you can call it censorship if you want. You can call it uh, limits to what can otherwise create extreme social consequences. Now, of course, the, the, the tricky thing is to find a system that can create such limits in a very democratic way. And this is why most countries in the world are ditching these responsibilities and try to delegate this to self-regulation. Because as soon as you try to regulate, everyone, literally everyone, including digital platforms with huge audiences, will accuse you of being a censor. And so it's it's very difficult, it's very hard politically to adopt this kind of regulation and to adopt something that could be meaningful besides the norms. Terrific. Excellent discussion here. I think we do have to move on because it's now four o'clock. We are going to move on to our final discussion. Um, and that would be the political context with Nada Pavon. So I'm just going to introduce Nada briefly and then once again uh, state the question that we gave to Nada. So Nada Pavon is assistant professor in political science at the Federal University of Pernambuco. Uh, she did her PhD at the University of Notre Dame, graduating in 2015. And she's a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions at Vanderbilt. She was 2015 to 2016. Her research focuses on political behavior, comparative politics, with an emphasis on misinformation, public opinion, and corruption in Latin America. Uh, so welcome, Nada. And here is the question that I gave, we gave to Nada. Um, Anita conjointly composed the questions with me. Please talk about the incumbent government's discourse. Is it socially inclusive or rather divisive? And how does it compare with the discourse of previous administrations? Please talk about the degree to which government ensures transparency and provides open government data. I can speak to this as well, including commitments, gaps, and pending challenges. And then finally, please talk about the extent to which government intervenes in the digital sphere including censorship, surveillance, and dissemination of disinformation. So we'll go with 10 minutes from Nara, and then once again, two minutes from uh, Vito. And Vito, your discussion uh, commentaries have been excellent, so thanks for your contribution, sir. So thank you, Greg. Um, so the questions uh, were about the incumbent government, and I will ask them by talking about specifically about the incoming government. However, I would also like to talk more broadly about political elites in general um, uh, and the role they play in, in, in this discussion about misinformation. Uh, because, you know, here, like not only the incumbent elites are important, but also, you know, those elites in the opposition, for instance, at least that's what I've been um, um, getting from 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 my my research, right? So they all play a very important role in the production and in the spread of misinformation. Um, so talking more specifically about the incoming government, I think it's reasonable to say that uh, this government's discourse is less divisive uh, than the discourse of the previous administration, um, simply because this government is a more moderate government. Um, whose electoral success was mostly due to its capacity to form a broad coalition. Uh, and we know that incentives for sharing misinformation and for using, for relying on misinformation as an electoral strategy has to do with, you know, how moderate or how extreme um, governments are. So more extreme governments are more likely to rely on misinformation and to manipulate um, information and to rely on divisive and you know uncivil uh, types of communication. So the fact that we have a more moderate government in power um, reduces the incentives for relying on that that type of communication. But I'm gonna get go back to that point uh, later on just to make a more nuanced um, analysis of that. Um, so during the 2022 presidential elections, for instance, the PT uh, and Lula 
uh, they uh, strongly appeal to the center of the political spectrum um, and uh, as a strategy to kind of, you know, form this broad coalition. Uh, and once you are talking to a more heterogeneous type of um, electorate, right, you it's 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 more difficult to use divisive content is more difficult to um you know to use uh inflammatory the type of inflammatory content that you often see in in um fake news and in misinformation content in general um so you know so during the elections we you know it's we 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 see this difference in patterns of in the patterns of communication in the two between the two groups and once elected, the incumbent government uh, also, you know, continued to be moderate, more moderate than the previous government. So, from a comparative perspective, um, but also the 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 PT government managed to establish a more peaceful uh, relationship with it, with traditional media in general, right? So, the the relationship between the former government and uh, the traditional media was very tense and very hostile. And that created incentives for the previous government to look for alternative channels of communication, right? And the goal of the previous government was really to bypass traditional media and to show that the government could, you know, kind of communicate with its uh, with with citizens, with people in general, without the help of the traditional gatekeepers, right? With traditional journalism and all of that. So I think because of the because the current the current government is more moderate and also more, and it has a, 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 a it, it does not have the kind of populist tone that the Bolsonaro government had. It helps to create a a safer uh, informational environment, I think, and less uh, um, less hostile as well. Um, and in terms of um, in terms of uh, the um, you know how the, the the initiatives of the government to fight misinformation, my impression is that the government uh, has not played the key role in fighting misinformation, and I I think we can say that about other governments around the world too. Mostly, you know, the initiatives to fight misinformation come from um, uh, civil society organizations. The media, traditional journalism, but also uh, courts in general, and and so I think in terms, if we think more broadly, and if we include courts as kind of part of a government, we can we can see that um, we are seeing now uh, more initiatives coming from courts in Brazil to kind of fight misinformation and to you know establish uh, a safer. Uh, environment at least thinking about about thinking more specifically about election related misinformation which is kind of uh what what this government has been targeting right mostly misinformation related to the electoral process which has been you know the main kind of the, the most concerning type of misinformation i would say right because it's not attacking specific political groups but attacking institutions and democracy and uh you know media and uh, courts, and and it's very uh, uh, interesting to see that you know Brazil has, in my opinion, one of the most uh, 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 has a very good electoral governance. It has a very good electoral electoral process, very reliable, very safe. Uh, at the same time, you know, in Brazil, we have seen uh, an increase in the perception that. Um, there's election fraud and that elections are rigged and this has all been promoted by misinformation. So I think the most, the, the, the biggest target of those efforts to fight misinformation are as the, the kind of the election related misinformation. But then when we kind of step back and think more broadly about political elites and not necessarily talking about, you know, the incumbent government, um, I think, you know, uh, basically, you know, I just would like to, say that elites play a very important role in spreading misinformation uh, because basically because elites are very powerful in shaping opinion in general, right? So we know that opinions are formed with the help of elites, right? We don't see everything, we are not aware of everything, and we often turn to elites to kind of get the signals and to form our opinions. 
So uh, it's very concerning when we see that political elites are uh, spreading misinformation because the potential the potential damage of that type of misinformation compared to, for instance, misinformation shared by regular social media users, it, it's more powerful, right? When it comes from elites. Um, and that was actually what motivated me to kind of um, to do research on um, kind of misinformation shared by political elites. And I've been doing, uh, been conducting the research since 2022 with uh, this research is funded by Facebook, Meta, um, and basically we are trying to detect and map the spread of misinformation by political elites in Brazil. And we collected um, social media posts from about um, a thousand politicians in Brazil. And so we collected posts from Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and also uh, YouTube. And that, uh, so we got about 4 million posts. That's our kind of data set from this uh, thousand politicians. And our main goal was to detect misinformation, to kind of have an idea of how, you know, how big the problem is, right? And how often political elites share misinformation. To do that, we had to uh, create a detection method to detect the type of misinformation that circulates in Brazil, because the type of misinformation that circulates here is very different from the type of fake news, for instance, that circulates in the US. Because for instance, in the US, misinformation circulates with hyperlinks to you know, websites and of poor uh, quality websites, right? In Brazil, fake news circulate you know, with images without hyperlinks. And so it's very hard to detect it, right? So the, out, the automated methods to detect misinformation in the US are very simple. Um, for us, it, you know, we had to rely on uh, artificial intelligence and other methods to you know, kind of detect this type of misinformation that circulates mostly on, in, on, on um, WhatsApp and Telegram. And we were shocked when we got the results back and we double checked them, but basically less than 1% of this 4 million posts uh, had fake news. Um, so basically, uh, that we, you know, our conclusion is that uh, sharing the uh, fake fake news by political elites is a rare event, but we also find that what elites share a lot is uh, biased content that is not necessarily false. It's not strictly false, right? But it's basically what we call hyper partisan, and I think that that's a very important. Um, it's a very important piece of information for us to kind of calibrate our visions about the problem, right? So maybe the problem is not strictly false information, uh, but, you know, this highly biased and inflammatory content that does not cross the line of being, you know, false. And I think it is important, too, because um, uh, this helps us, you know, to kind of... Um, understand, you know, there's other studies, for instance, not looking at elites, but looking at uh, misinformation shared by regular social media users with study published at, uh, published at uh, Science that shows that it's, you know, face, uh, false information, fake news is not uh, abundant in social media. What's really abundant is uh, hyperpartisan news, this kind of biased uh, type of information. And the other thing we did after we detected misinformation was to look at going back to the original question to um, who shares more, you know, out of this thousand politicians, what are the politicians that share more uh, uh, um, fake news? And so we find that, you know, 1% of the 4 million posts contained misinformation and about 15% of the thousand politicians shared misinformation at least once, right? So 15 uh, percent. And we find that politicians aligned with Bolsonaro or aligned with Lula are way more likely to share misinformation than politicians that are independent. They are, you know, that they, they are not aligned with the two main coalitions or with the two main poles of the political spectrum. So basically that reinforced the idea that, you know, basically they're there are no saints, <laughs> you know, and basically politicians have incentives to uh, spread misinformation and those incentives are political. And, um, you know, basically we confirm also the idea that fake news, like true news, 
they do not lead to persuasion. They do not change people's minds, or at least they do not change people's uh, political preferences. What it does, according to our study, is that fake news mobilizes voters and make them more politically active and more willing to um, participate in election-related activities. Right. That was super interesting. Very interesting research, Nada. Um, let's go ahead and hear Vito's commentary and then open it up for debate. Okay, thank you, Nara. Uh, thank you a lot. Very interesting reflections. Uh, you recently uh, presented the results of a study on the relationship between conspiracy theories and support for democracy. And conspiracy theories uh, differ, differ uh, greatly from other types of discourse that are studies in the digital environment. Uh, hate speech and civility, for example, they are characterized by uh, being directed primarily uh, against a minority or a vulnerable group. And the target of a conspiracy, however, uh, is, is not a minority. Uh, on the contrary, uh, the conspiracy targets the majority. It's characterized precisely by revealing that the majority, us, uh, we are they we are uh, uh, have, we are manipulated by the majority the min uh, a minority, so I see a uh, conspiracy as a, a kind of invitation, seeking to attract more and more and not to divide. They want to attract more and more conspirators. Uh, in this sense, uh, conspiracy theories have an enormous uh, political potential, and they are 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 being used by political elites, uh, including the former president Bolsonaro, uh, intensively, uh, uh, including in the period when he was in the power. So I would like to ask you on how we can relate uh, the conspiracy theories, which I understand are uh, uh, a type of discourse uh, in the, the in the range of discourse that we study in, in digital uh, public debate, so disinformation, misinformation, fake news, hate speech, and I believe that conspiracy theories are uh, in the middle of it, and maybe they uh, perhaps they uh, are more used by uh, political elites, for example, than uh, fake news. So I don't know exactly uh, the answer of, uh, of this question, but uh, I would like to ask you how we can relate conspiracy theories to a broader strategy of socialization and political radicalization, intensified, of course, by the engagement of political elites in their dissemination. Great, Victor. These are great questions. Um, so I classify... Um, conspiracy theories as a type, a subtype of misinformation too, right? Uh, and the main difference between a conspiracy theory and a fake news, for instance, is that the, the false news tries to fabricate an event, right? So that's why we call it news, right? Because it's trying to fabricate something. The conspiracy theories are not a fabricated event, but they are explanations that try to uh, account for an event that actually happened. So you can question whether the the whether whether the stabbing was fake or not, but it happened. So the event was there. We all saw it on TV, and we have different explanations for the stabbing, right? Whether it was orchestrated by the left or whether it was a fake yada, right? So we have these different interpretations. Um, so I think it's a very, uh, to me at least, this is the most concerning type of misinformation because it combines two things. It combines. Um, it challenges official accounts for important events, right? So by doing that, it reduces trust in traditional media and in the traditional explanations that you know we get from elites in a democracy, you know, from journalists and from you know the federal police and things like that, right? So it challenges these official accounts, and also it portrays, it misrepresents ordinary political disputes. They are super normal in a democracy. Um, uh, it, it represents these disputes in a very Machiavellian, you know, term. So it really, you know, says that, you know, people do not want you to know the truth and people are conspiring against you. There's this minority elite that it's evil, you know, and that it's, you know, uh, working behind the scenes uh, to, you know, to basically, you know, uh, um, to take rights and, 
and resources from from the poor and from the you know naive citizens, right? Um, so I think it's a, it's a very uh, dangerous type of misinformation, uh, even more dangerous than fake news, for instance. Um, but I and, and in my study, I we do randomly expose people to watch conspiratory videos about the stabbing of Bolsonaro, and we find that it does reduce uh, support for democracy, mostly in the in the electoral dimension. So it makes people less likely to accept uh, the result of the elections. It makes them less likely to trust the electoral process. And we see that we do not find effects on hostility, for instance. We do not find that exposure to conspiracy theories increase political hostility. So it does not lead to polarization, but it decreases trust in institutions. So I think it's it's a very it's a potentially very dangerous type of you know misinformation. Quick, can I go quickly? Um, I just wanted to to add on to all this because so from the political point of view, this is my interest as well, and I'm a little different from. Not on that I'm not so much interested in public opinion, public perceptions, and so forth, but I am interested in the phenomenon of government actually manipulating information because I think that we've traditionally seen government as the sort of the fountainhead of accurate and reliable information in our information ecosystem, right? And that media was the mediator and fact checker, and it could be reliable too, but it was more often partisan traditionally and so forth. So government is now, uh, you know, the democratic governments because of ideological polarization are engaging in what is widely reported. There's a whole literature in political science that not many people know about, which is called statistical misreporting. And statistical misreporting is, when I was at MIT uh, visiting, as a visiting scholar, there was a, a Vietnamese scholar who was finishing his PhD, who's now at Purdue, and his name is Min Trin. And Min was doing research on statistical misreporting in Vietnam and China. And basically, the essence of the argument is that there are very perverse incentives for misreporting data in general, meaning whether it be GDP growth or you know achievements or whatever it might be. In, in the and so what happens effectively is you can no longer relate you can no longer rely on government data and so even the top policymakers in government don't rely on government data per se they end up relying on their stomachs or their hunch or you know their personal contacts and so forth and who they can trust and this is a situation obviously we want to avoid because the whole point is to make informed decisions, evidence-based decisions, right? Which is it's, it's absolutely necessary to have gov good, reliable government data in that sense. So a huge danger for me from a transparency perspective is seeing statistical misreporting occurring, especially in these populist governments, Bolsonaro and Trump. I documented this in a piece I published in January of last year in administration and society, but it's it's a major concern of mine. So if anyone wants to comment that, go ahead. And I'll finish with that. Anita and Thais, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, 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 Nara. And I'm very much looking forward to reading those articles. So, uh, make sure to send me the links via mail. Uh, because I think that's a lot of insight there on, you know, on on political uh, communication and, and information or misinformation strategies. Uh, I do have a question, though, for all of you two guys, because I think it's a question that sits a bit between the political context and the legislative institutional context. And it's a question, it's the question that concerns, so what has the government or what is the government effectively doing to combat uh, disinformation. And it's been sort of a blind spot in my um, 
research here or my interviews so far because basically I think uh, the the opinions of my interviewees uh, were very controversial about this uh, and it's about the fact that one of the well first uh, things that the new Lula government did uh, when coming into the office was to create this new body um, the Procuraduría de Defensa de Democracia uh, in the AGU, which is uh, uh, I think it translates to Attorney General, uh, Greg, right? Um, and so, yeah, my interview partners had very controversial, first of all, many of them didn't know, they said, what are they, what are they actually going to do? What is their task going to be? Because they cannot prosecute. Uh, so the name is even misleading. And others said, well, and this is a question I'm asking myself too, is it appropriate to have a body that close uh, to the executive and with so little independence from the executive being the one in charge of, you know, judging what is and what is not disinformation? And if they are not, who would you think would be an appropriate body or authority in Brazil to to? to take on that task or to have that sort of responsibility. That's something I'd be, yeah, very interested to hear all of you guys' opinions about. Well, uh, I would like to add um, a point about the, the difference in the speech between Lula and Bolsonaro. Last year, I participated in a study in which we analyzed the speech about disinformation by Lula and Bolsonaro uh, to investigate what they mean when they refer to fake news and other similar terms. Uh, it was clear that Lula appropriated the meaning of disinformation from journalism or academy, while Bolsonaro used fake news to attack journalists as well, Trump and others. But I have a specific concern both in the campaign and in the government, Lula uh, or his team created official fact-checking channels. And there was criticism precisely about transparency regarding the sources, method. Uh, well, uh, my, my question uh, for you, Nara, uh, I would like to hear you because you have a background different from me. Uh, what you you think? What do you think about it? Uh, about this official fact checking as a measure to fight disinformation in the government, uh, or if this kind of fact checking maybe just confirm convictions uh, in a disinformation scenario? And well, I would like to hear you about it if we have time. The answer now, or should we wait for Nina to ask a question? Yeah, maybe it would be best to wait for Nina. Nina, go ahead, please. Sure. Um, I have a small comment about um what you said, Nara. When you you said that you identified that both you know supported politicians that were aligned with Bolsonaro and Lula shared um fake news, but not supposedly independent um politicians. I was a little, you know, I, I know that, you know, we have fake news from the left and from the right and from the far right, but I also think that it's not always the same. It doesn't always mean the same thing to share fake news in two senses. First, in the sense of how structured this um, action of sharing fake news is. I think there is a difference between a certain politician or a certain group that supports a politician and that eventually is going to use intentionally or not um, fake news to as a political strategy and a political group that has like a well-established structured and financed structure to spread um, disinformation as a political strategy. So I think that's one difference that we need to take into account. And the second one is also uh, not necessarily related to the structure, but to the content itself, where, what do these um, misinformations in, at least talk about? 
what do they intend to do? Not that there is better or worse wrong information, but just to understand that maybe there are differences in what are they being used to do. So I, th I would like to hear you more about that. And answering um, the what Anita said about wh what do we think about what the government is doing, um, there are controversies, and I, I was in the in the working group that discussed the Procuradoria de Def da Defesa da Democracia, so we can talk more after about that. But it, it's very controversial, but it's, it's also specific in, the, in theory specific about um, disinformation um, related to public policy, whatever that is. I don't like the concept, but anyway. Uh, and there is the, the other controversy that Thais mentioned also about the supposedly fact-checking governmental agency or whatever. But it, apart from that, I also think that um, I, I really like uh, many of the initiatives that the government has taken not necessarily from the executive, but also dialoguing with the other powers in terms of uh, putting forward um, the, the legislative projects, the so-called fake news bill, the, the project of 2630, and now also 2370, which is more controversial than the 2630, I think. But anyway, it has been very active. It did create um, many structures inside the government, either in the... Uh, communication secretary or in the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Health, in many parts of the government, there are specific structures in the Ministry of Justice to deal with digital topics. So I think that's very um, positive. And I think that they have been putting this as a priority in the national and international arena. And I also see that with good eyes and of course, there are many, many, many problems on the way, but I also think that we are advancing somehow. So I I would just like to share my thoughts on that. Right. Anita, did you want to chime in? No, no, that's that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nina. And I'd love to to discuss more in depth about the, the Procuraduria. Um, that, that should be very interesting. I hope we find an opportunity outside of this um, event. Okay, yes. Without It's amazing that we've managed completely to avoid the whole polarizing aspect of Bolsonaro, Lula, for the most part, um, and uh, my own impression is that there is a certain amount of self-censorship going on, especially surrounding Lava Jato. Um, but that's my perhaps my own impression. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to discuss this issue, but it seems like we've exhausted this and we're actually at time. So 4.30. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to... Uh, finish up with our essentially with the closing session, which is a final question. And that is what actions need to be taken or prioritized in order to counter disinformation and its negative impacts for democracy and social cohesion in Brazil. So perhaps we could, um, Luca, I hope you have something to say about this. Um, Victor um, as well, Thais and everyone, I would like to hear from everyone maybe as you know two minutes each um what can we do i'm going to repeat the question again what actions need to be taken prioritized in order to counter disinformation and its negative impacts for democracy and social cohesion in brazil well so what can we do and it's funny i have not mentioned have not heard mention anyone having to do with education i mean it seems to me that disinformation is mitigated through education right and so it's not all about the media. It's also about let's promote equity and inclusion and get people more educated so that they're more informed and less susceptible to disinformation as well, right? I know this is a long-term project, and that's perhaps why no one is talking about it, that everyone is sort of, okay, what are we going to do immediately to make the situation better? But maybe that should not be our only perspective. All right, so let's go um, in order of presentation this morning. So Anita, do you want to start and say what we, and then we can go Nina, 
uh, Thais, uh, Luca, and Nara. Uh, sorry, and yeah, Vito, you can finish off because you've always been the discussant. You can finish off as a discussant. You, you do not actually want to put me as a foreigner in a position where I now tell Brazil what it needs to do to combat disinformation. But well, um, maybe you can be the discussant at the end then, okay? But I might, no, I, I mean, I do have, I, I have to say, so having been here for, for a month, uh, I mean, I see a lot of problematic things, but I have to say, and, and you know, like uh, fostering, uh, or, or, or talking in favor of a positive agenda, I also have seen a lot of remarkable uh, initiatives, both from the side of civil society as from, you know, state agents. I, I think there are a lot of great initiatives in terms of transparency out there. The transparency portal this is something that we, we don't really have a centralized transparency portal in in Germany. So that's something I find impressive. Uh, then I uh, was in Brasilia, I learned about uh, how far along the, the process of digitalizing the justice system is. So I learned about the Justicia 4.0 program, uh, found that very impressive. But I feel what is lacking, uh, and maybe the, the education part comes a bit in here, Greg, as well, is that I think that to date, uh, uh, Brazilian state actors still fail um, to, to translate um, all of this great information that is out there to an audience um, with lower levels of education. And I think in a country that has this huge, you know, like educational uh, gap, uh, discrepancies. Uh, this is this is necessary. So there's a lot of information out there, loads of data out there, but in part it is not very it is not accessible and it's not understandable to the general um, public. Or well, in Mexico uh, they they would have called them the ciudadano de pe. Uh, I don't know if if you have that expression in um, in Brazil. And that's a problem. And so I think that it needs to be translating government data and government information into something that's understandable for the general public and also making continued investment in improving uh, media literacy and digital skills. So I think this, this will be important for Brazil. All right, terrific. Nina? Yeah, I think Anita already brought some elements to the equation. Um, I would say um, I won't be exhaustive. There are many more things, but some things that come to mind. Regulation, I think regulation, uh, platform, big tech regulation is urgent in Brazil. We need to have more established rules about transparency, about advertisements, about you know how they operate in our country. Second thing I would say, promote um, quality information or quality journalism. So both in terms of sustainability of journalism organizations, in terms of promoting diversity and pluralization, I'm sorry, um, of information sources. I think that's also key to what we're doing. Um, actions related to political culture in general. So I think the problem of polarization, radicalization, sedimentation or whatever we're talking about is not only about the digital. So I think um, political culture is at the center of what we are discussing. And last but not least, actions that aim uh, at fighting uh, misogyny, racism and other kinds of discrimination because I think um, we are very wrong. We have been discussing regulation of big tech very much. And sometimes I see that people are, people think that regulation is going to solve 100% or at least 95% of our problems. And I am sure it won't. So if we don't fight the base of our pro social problems that are not necessarily, but also related to the digital, I think we're not going to go far. So that would be it. Terrific. Thais. Well, I referred before about media literacy, transparency, uh, and uh, regulation, and uh, in order, I think, because I, I really believe in, in media literacy in, in a 
a big sense, not only media, uh, but uh, also civic literacy, because we need to know our rights, uh, people need to know democracy history and uh, democracy structure uh, about our responsibility when we uh, uh, chose uh, some politicians in a democracy structure. So I think uh, every, uh, uh, everything is part of uh, a media literacy in a um, uh, digital society. And well, transparency uh, from politicians, from journalists, from platforms to know the, the rules. And about regulation, uh, I uh, understand this uh, uh, point, not only about platforms or algorithms, but also about access, internet access. Uh, when we uh, think about uh, Brazil uh, ecosystem in, in, in this sense, when we um, have uh, social media free in, in some kinds of uh, uh, phone plans, uh, zero rating uh, for uh, social media, we are not uh, talking about internet, but just uh, social media. So it is a problem and it is a problem to fight this information. So uh, it is not uh, a new question. It is previous on Marco Civil the Internet when refer neutrality. So uh, we have, uh, I think, to discuss this point more profoundly. That's it. Terrific. All right, Luca. Yeah, I think I think we should try to think a little bit in a more systemic way and be a little bit more pragmatic and also self-confident to some extent. Uh, systemic way, because as I will I try to, to, to illustrate, uh, if you only look at a specific side of the problem, uh, we risk uh, missing the forest, only looking at the tree. Uh, and so again, we should try to connect the various layers of the problem, not only the content, but also the access, for instance. Uh, in a, in being more pragmatic, understanding that when we have, an, I know that it's very difficult to have consen, uh, consensus sorry, in a, in, a, in a legislature about a new law. And so when we approve a new law, we are ecstatic about the fact that now we have the law and the problem will be solved. But that is really only the the, the beginning of the regulatory journey. And if it's very, uh, you know, as Roscoe Pound used to say, it's very different to have law in, in books and law in action. So you have, uh, when you have to implement it, uh, you have to match the law, the regulation, uh, with a very effective system, which uh, is badly uh, missed in most global South, both for very limited resources for implementation but also to some extent for very uh, limited uh, institutional maturity of uh, regulators or independence of regulators. And last but not least, why being self-confident? Because I think that part of the mistakes we are doing in Brazil and in other global South con countries that we copy and paste from Europe. And we think that by copying and paste uh, from what works or maybe that doesn't even work yet in Europe as Europe is more developed, we will uh, immediately solve the problem. I see this very, very much in a very related debate, which is AI regulation. Europe has just uh, adopted, it's in the process actually of finalizing the adoption of AI acts that will have enormous impact also on digital platforms. Uh, and a lot of countries, including Brazil, are starting to cap copy and paste provisions, but that is not even a model that is working yet. Uh, so it's, it, it's it, I, I would uh, suggest a little bit of caution uh, before thinking that by copying and pasting from Europe, we really have a solution and maybe try to think a little bit more to the specific dynamics of global South countries. Terrific. So we are at the end. Vito, any final comments? Okay, thank you a lot for the invitation. Uh, asking the Thinking loud about your question, uh, look out. Looking at our recent past, 
my biggest problem uh, is not exactly the circulation of disinformation. Uh, this phenomenon seems to me absolutely connected to the dynamics of contemporary political disputes, especially in digital environments. And of course, I'm not diminishing the risks and the problems that this information brings, but I'm primarily concerned when uh, conspiracies, disinformation, moral panic uh, spill over from more engaged groups to ordinary citizens without a much uh, a strong political alignment. And I think there's a fundamental role uh, for the political elites and press in lowering uh, the, the temperature of public debate and avoiding and avoid this predisposition uh, to creating enemies. Uh, one event that I consider uh, successful uh, was uh, the great coalition around trust in el electronic ballot boxes. I remember that a few months uh, before the elections, uh, PDT raised doubts about the ballot boxes, but they 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 uh, back it down. And in the end, the discourse on fraud of uh, ballot boxes was isolated. Uh, of course, it's too strong and has an impact. We saw at uh, January 8th, but imagine if uh, uh, it would be, I, I believe that it would be even worse if it wasn't isolated as uh, is it was. So it's a complex issue, but I think there are some elements that can help us to address this issue. Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you all for your participation and to audience. Um, Anita, do you have any final words for us? Thanks for helping to co-organize this. Obviously, uh, you know, you're instrumental and this is an interesting focus. Um, certainly, we have a lot to talk about still about this and the possibility of publishing something. And I'd like to see your final research on Mexico and other places as well. No? Thanks, thanks. And thanks to all of you, actually, because this is uh, also, uh, for me, this workshop has been, you know, uh, in addition to the interviews I have conducted so far, really another very important instrument of, of data collection for my research. Uh, and so I'm very grateful for all of you to, to having dedicated your time to this to discuss with us here uh, to date. I'll make sure to uh, share also my research on uh, on Brazil when the study is finally uh, published. Well, I hope that will happen towards the end of the year because I've like collected a lot of material that I need to structure and analyze. Uh, I'd also like to thank with the audience that has uh, been with us and stuck with us until the end. Unfortunately, they are on YouTube and did not have um, opportunity to um to yeah uh, interact directly with the panelists so uh, anybody who's still out there uh feel free to reach out um maybe on linkedin maybe uh by a mail however um and yeah thanks to everybody and and have a great afternoon and i hope to be in touch okay thank you again nara vito thais now luca nina bye-bye Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.